How's everybody doing today? I certainly hope you're doing well. You're probably wondering why Monty is wearing a tie. Well, I'm communicating with someone. Yeah, sure am. And I'm sure they're going to get the message loud and clear. Because you see, sometimes, these days, you just can't email one party to another because a certain person lock her up and tell you all about that. Because there's nothing that you do on your machine that ever goes away. Never. So if you're going to communicate, well, you got to communicate through some sort of symbols or symbolism or through the media, through maybe textiles or all different ways to communicate. Because all these things really do tie in together, if you get my meaning. But today, we're going to do a story time. And if you are the type of person that gets pretty jumpy and squirrely about frightening or scary stories, do not listen to this one. Because it is truly terrifying. Alright? Just in time for Halloween. But before we start, let's go ahead and talk about how things tie into each other, shall we? You see, back in the 50s, 60s, especially the 60s and 70s, the intelligence community, through the telecommunications, had about 10 words that if you said those words in succession, you would have a live monitor. In other words, it would trigger a computer system for the NSA to essentially come in and listen, in other words, a live monitor listening to the conversation, because you decided to use, let's say, the B word. Starts with a B, ends with a B. You decided to use the B word in succession over and over and over again. It's like they trigger, oh yeah, okay, let's listen to what you got to say. And who you're talking to, and the location of the person that made the call, and the location of the person receiving the call, and who that person is that you're talking to, and who the hell you are, your name, your date of birth, all that stuff, your entire back, everything. Right? So here's the thing. When you inundate an entire community and or country, with the use of a word that starts with a B and ends with a B, you inundate the security services, the intelligence services, that monitor those sorts of words in succession via internet and via all telecommunications. So consequently, what does that mean? That means that that word for the time being, has to be scrubbed off the triggering system for a live monitor. They all sort of tie in together, if you get my meaning. So let's go ahead and start. By the way, that's a true story. By the way, let's go ahead and start with our story. This story is not a true story. It's a story in which Monty created. The name of the story is called Ice Flight 777. So let's go ahead and begin, shall we? You see, there was a woman about the age of 27. Her name was Sayla. Sayla was very, very fit. She used to jog every day, right? She'd get up 5.30 in the morning, she'd go for a jog. She'd go to work. She'd come home from work. She'd put on her sweats and that and go jogging again. Right? Very, very fit. Very muscular. But sexy as hell, too. You get my meaning? Really long, pretty hair. Kind of like Mrs. Marshall. Just beautiful. Kind of thick, but sexy as hell, right? Well, you see, Sayla, she lived in Washington State. And Sayla, she didn't just jog around the neighborhood. No, sir, no, ma'am. 
she used to go jogging up in the hills. And a lot of times when she'd go up in those hills, she'd have to bring a coat with her because it'd be a little bit chilly, maybe a little bit foggy and rainy and that sort of thing. Old Sailor, she's doing her thing. She gets off work about 5 o'clock. She suits up. She puts on her little windbreaker and such. She goes up and she drives up into the hills there. And then she gets out of her car and she starts a jogging. And she doesn't have to worry about nobody accosting her. I tell you what, she's a bad woman. And get a big old roundhouse, you get me? She's fit. Oh my gosh, she's fit. Real muscular. Especially in her legs. Very, very fit. Well, Sayla comes back and from her jogging and she sits down at her kitchen table. She's eating a salad she put together. She's got this salad all filled up with all the special trimmings, right? She's got the fresh mushrooms and the fresh spinach. She's got, of course, the fresh lettuce, right? She gets out her ranch dressing. She's got salt and pepper in there, the whole nine yards. A couple of little radishes. Oh, boy, it's, it's all decked out. She's enjoying her salad. She turns on the radio and... Starts listening to these like, you're unblockable. That's what you are. Remember that from Blog TV? You're unblockable. She doesn't want to listen to that, right? So she starts going through the channels. Say la vie, say la vie. That's how she got her name, say la vie. <laughs> That's how she got her name, say la. Right? Because of that song back in the day. Something else, isn't it? So she starts running through the band. In the news today. And she gets into this advertisement. The advertisement is talking about an airline. An airline by the name of Manum. That's M I N U M. Like, I've never heard of this airline. She's listening a little bit closer while she's eating her salad. she got a tall glass of water with a couple of ice cubes in it. Oh, that's a good time, isn't it? She's listening to this advertisement that is stating that so many people across the nation and every state in the Union will be chosen for a flight. A flight is, that is going to fly from New York to Sydney, Australia in one hour and six minutes. One hour and six minutes, what? That's impossible. She starts listening a little bit closer and they're talking about so many people, 245 people are going to be chosen all over the nation for this once-in-a-lifetime flight from New York to Australia. And each participant will receive $5,000 in cash, will be placed in a hotel, five-star hotel, <laughs> in Sydney, Australia with all of their meals paid, and they'll be, in five days later, will be flown back to New York. All expenses paid plus five grand. <laughs> and all of the people that were chosen for this flight, they would have their name on a big old brass plaque at the Manum headquarters of this airlines. Yes, sir, yes, ma'am. Boy, that's that's quite prestigious. Even though she's never heard of Manum, right? So she turns down the radio a little bit. She's finishing up her salad and a glass of water with a couple of ice cubes in it. <laughs> she gets up on her phone. She types in Manum. She's never heard of this. Manum, Manum Airlines. What the hell is that? And it's talking about how Manum Airlines, there's this plane that they built that is the fastest passenger plane in the world. And if you are chosen out of all these people around the nation, 245 people, if you're chosen, you're going to get an all-expensive paid vacation. Plus, they're going to give you $5,000 in spending money. Oh my goodness, she's having all kinds of little thoughts. Because, you see, 
Sayla has never been out of the United States, and she's so excited. She's thinking, oh, I hope they pick me up. Of course they're going to pick me. She has this feeling about that they're going to pick her. But think about how many people are in the United States. There's 320 million people in the United States. What are the chances of that happening? Pretty, pretty slim. So Sayla goes off to sleep. She wakes up the next morning and her phone is... Right? She's getting a little text message. And the text message is coming from Manum Airlines. She's verifying it is ManumAirlines.com, right? And it's saying that she's one of the people that have been chosen. She's like, wow, this is really, okay, this is a little bit weird, you know, it's it's probably a fluke, it's probably just somebody razzing me, it's nonsense, I don't believe this, it's just too close, I listened to the advertisement last night when I was, you know, eating my salad and such, and then all of a sudden this morning, I, I don't think so. So she goes to the website, and it asks for her first name, her middle initial, and her initial of her last name and her zip code, right? She types that in because that's not too personal information now, is it? Your first name, your middle initial, and the initial of your last name, that's not too personal. Plus your zip code, big deal. She types that in there and the next thing you know, all this information comes up about her. Her photograph comes up, all of her social media accounts come up, all of her email accounts come up, all of her family members and all of her relatives and all of her friends and all of her acquaintance and their pictures, and she's like, wow! So this is some sort of verification that she really has been chosen. And at the very bottom, there's a 1-800 number for her to call. Well, immediately... Seeing that she just, she only typed in her first name, her middle initial, and the initial of her last name is zip code. But somehow, some way, Manum Airlines knows everything about this woman. She's kind of flipped out about it. But hey, who can pass up an all-expenses paid flight to Australia? What, are you kidding me? Plus $5,000? Yeah, okay. She calls them up. And they ask her to type in the verification code. She's like, well, where's the verification code? He said, well, it's all the way down of the information which you just pulled up on the site. So she's scrolling all down there. She's going through all her friends, all her social media, all her emails, everything. And at the very, very bottom, there's an alphanumeric number in which he keys in. Sure enough, there's six, six letters and numbers there. She types that in. She types it in on the website, and she states what that code is by voice on the phone to verify, right? And sure enough, she's been chosen. Wow. Now this is in, for the most part, the end of summer, August. It's kind of late August. So it's still kind of warm out. I mean, it's certainly not cold. It's very nice out. Summertime, right? So, according to her, she starts saying, now listen here, I, you know, Who's going to cover the flight from Washington State to New York? And they're like, oh, we will. What? So um, she's trying to ask these little questions. So let me see if I got this straight. You're going to fly me from Washington State to New York. You're going to fly me from New York to Sydney, Australia, where I'm going to stay for five days in five-star hotels and all that stuff and pay for my meals and everything. Give me $5,000 in cash. Then you're going to fly me back to New York. And then my name is going to be on some brass plaque at, at Manum Airlines headquarters. Then you're going to fly me from New York back to Washington State. Is that what you're trying to tell me? Well, yes, ma'am. That's exactly what we're telling you. She's like, okay, this sounds fantastic. This is awesome. Fantastic. But when is the flight going to occur? Well, it's not too far away. It's going to happen on... It's going to be on the 11th. The 11th of Sapphire. Yeah, just amazing. 
She's all for it. And you see, Manum Airlines is choosing all of these other people all over the nation. So as time is going on and on, she's getting really jazzed about it. She's going out and she's jogging just like she does. She goes to work. She's telling all her friends that she was chosen. She's one of the people that was chosen to be on the Manum Airlines. What are you kidding me? The fastest airliner in the world. She's going to be on some brass black. Oh, she's so excited. She, oh, I tell you what, it's awesome. She's calling up her folks and all her friends. And even some of the friends she forgot about because it was in the lineup on the ManumeAirlines.com. When she typed in her first name, middle initial, middle, uh, the first initial of her last name, and brrr, all this stuff comes up. There's a couple of friends she forgot about. Not to be rude, but hey, that's the way it is. You know how it goes. She's calling them. She's like, oh, they're all... Oh, congratulations, carrying on. So here it is, the morning of Sapphire 11. She flies from Washington State into New York. She arrives in New York in the afternoon of Sapphire 11. Yeah, huh, darn this thing. And as other people start showing up, she notices something kind of strange. Yeah. She notices all the other people that are showing up are between the ages of about, she's just guessing, 18 to about 28 in that area. It's kind of warm out that day, nice and sunny, not a cloud in the sky. It's the darndest thing. And she starts asking these people. She doesn't even know. Hey, um, you know, I, I don't know you. I'm from Washington State. And hey, congratulations. They're congratulating each other. How old are you? One of them said 24. Another one said 18. Another one said 22. Another one said 26. Another one said 27. Hey, I'm 27 too, right? Something's goofy here. Something's wrong. What's going on? All the people. Hundreds of people here that have been chosen for this flight 77, 777. <laughs> Unbelievable. Or between the ages of 18 and 28. She's wondering about that. She starts getting a little bit inquisitive. Hmm, kind of like Southern folk. Southern folk, we're, we are not nosy. We're inquisitive. There's a difference. Right? So she walks up to one of the representatives at the at the uh, counter there. And of course they got their uh, Monum Airlines logo and the whole nine yards. Hmm. She goes, I, I was just kind of curious. Um, why is it that um, these hundreds of people that have been chosen for this flight, why is it they're only between the ages of 18 and what appears to be 28? She goes, well, the reason why that is, is because this is the fastest airline in the world. In the world. And even though it's been tested with a couple of people here and there, it's never been tested with every seat filled. And to be quite honest, seeing that it is the fastest plane in the world, we don't want to have people having heart attacks. You know what I mean? We don't want people having strokes. We don't want people getting so excited that, you know, something happens physically or psychologically. So we felt the need to get people that are in a younger age bracket, not to discriminate, but for safety's sakes. Sailor's like, that makes sense. Well, thank you. So as all these people are getting round up and they're just basically laying down the law, laying down the rules, that when you get on the ICE Flight 777, you are to turn off your phones and fasten your seat belts and follow all the safety procedures that the airline has in place there. A lot of these people out there, I tell you what, they're wearing shorts. They got on these Hawaiian shirts because well, they're going to Australia. But I tell you what, not sailor, not sailor, uh-uh. Nope. She's wearing long jogging pants. She's all layered up. 
she's sweating too pretty hard because everybody else wearing Hawaiian shirts and shorts and carrying on and about. <laughs> Whereas old Selah, she's all layered up because she's, you know, was jogging and carrying on every morning, 5.30 in the morning, carrying on in Washington State. Right? Boom! Gets a little bit chilly up in them hills. Right? And another reason why she'd wear her windbreaker is because it had really good pockets. You know, to keep her cell phone, little personal effects and such. So she just sweating. Everybody else is like, man, you're, you're overdressed, uh, Sayla. Whatever, right? So they all board the plane. Everybody gets up on the plane. Well, Sayla, she gets a window. God love her. Look at her go. She's got somebody else sitting next to her. Quite a bit younger. Not a quite 10 years, but they're 18. Right? So she starts talking to him. Hey, so where are you from? He's from Texas. She gets the window there. She's pretty proud of herself. And the thing is, she's only about seven rows down on the far right-hand side of the plane next door window. So she can see the people in the middle row, and then she can see the row over because it's like three rows. It's like you got four seats in the middle, and then you got two on the side over here and two on the side over there. And then you got the halls that go down, right? And then, of course, you got the flight attendants, little area, little curtain, and all nine yards, right? So everybody gets on the plane. They're putting up all the little effects up there in the little cupboards above the seats. You know how it is. Hmm. And this woman comes out. Everybody's sitting down. They have all the little TV monitors and everything. They're like, ladies and gentlemen, welcome aboard of Manum Airlines. Shortly, we will be issuing, by seat number and name, your checks. Those checks can be cashed at a specific place in the airport, at the Sydney airport, right? Boy, this is, wow, they're just so excited. So they go down, they got this little chart there, and they're reading off their names. They're matching up the names with the seat number, and they're handing, verifying, are you Sela? Yes, they hand her her check, and it's got her, her first ma name and middle initial and last name, the $5,000 from Manum Airlines. It's like, what? This is awesome. How could anything go wrong? Golly gee gee whiz, when you're in the mind of Monty, everything can go wrong. Especially when you're writing these stories. Not that I write them, I just remember them. Right? So once everybody is seated, they got all their checks and stuff. Captain comes over and says, Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Manoon Airlines, the fastest airline in the world. And he keeps going on and on and on about the history and how it's been tested, but it hadn't been tested with a full plane of passengers and why it is that they chose people from 18 to 28 to make sure of safety issues. Nobody had a heart attack. They got excited and carrying on. Right. Please fasten your seatbelt and turn off your phones. We are now taxiing out. Sailors looking out the window and they're taxiing out, right? Really slow. They're turning, you know how it is, right? Turning again. <laughs> They're getting ready to take off. Sailor's looking out the window. She's looking around. Everybody's talking. His chatter's going on, carrying on. And here they go. They start taking off. <laughs> you know that noise that makes it really kind of weird. The nose says, Takes off, boy. <laughs> you're all going back like this. You know how it is. But you can't really tell how fast you're going because you're up in the air. It's not like there's light posts underneath the side going. Doo, 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 doo. You don't know how fast you're going. You can't even tell. So they're supposed to fly from New York to Sydney, Australia in one hour and six minutes. What? Huh. Son of a gun. Well, hell, one hour and six minutes goes by pretty fast when you're up in the when you're up in the air, doesn't it? I mean, everybody understands what that is. I mean, that's nothing. I mean, just to take a flight from Washington State to New to New York, 
It's a hell of a lot longer than an hour and six minutes, I'll tell you that. Something else. Wow. Huh. So Sailor is talking to the person next to her. They're like giggling, carrying on. So what are you going to do with your 5000 Well, What are you going to do with your... 5000 not a lot of money. A lot of money to people that young. A lot of money to people like me. Nobody, right? Oh, man. They're hoo-hoo and ha-ha and laughing and giggling and carrying on. Well, what do you do for a living? Where do you live? And Well, he's from Texas. She's from Washington. They're just carrying on, going about. Then all of a sudden, they start hit, hitting some turbulence. Right? And the captain comes on. Ladies and gentlemen, please fasten your seat belts. We're hitting a little bit of turbulence. So people are they're settling up. They're getting a little bit nervous, okay? Because this is like the test flight. I mean, there's nothing wrong with having your name on a plaque, but you want to be alive to see it. You know what I'm talking about? So they start jumping around a little bit, right? And then... All of a sudden, you hear that meep, 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 meep. You can hear it in a distance. And then you see all the flight attendants. They're racing off to, you know, their little cubicle areas or whatever. And they're strapping in their thing. Oh, boy, there's a problem. Sail is starting to get nervous. The captain comes on. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a slight bit of an emergency. Please put on your mask. All the masks drop up out of the, you know, all the little cupboards and that and fall right down. And people are starting to panic, man. They're like, oh, my God. And all this... And people put on their masks and they start breathing the oxygen just in case. And all of a sudden you get that. Boy, it, it's not looking good. It's not looking good. Sailor's looking out the wind, making sure, they're making sure there's no engine on fire or anything crazy like that. Make sure all the flaps are working okay. Not that she's a pilot, but hey, you know what I'm saying. She takes her mask and she puts it on. She starts breathing and she notices that doesn't smell like oxygen. Uh-uh. No, sir. No, ma'am. You see, Sayla is a jogger. Sayla is a professional jogger. Sayla is a professional when it comes to working out and that sorts of things. And when she has entered into these races and such and these marathons, sometimes people need oxygen, including her. And it doesn't smell anything like oxygen at all. It's got a very bizarre metallic smell about it. So she takes it off. And everybody else is freaking out. They have theirs on there. They're like, hold on to it. And all of a sudden, you hear this coming up out of the venting or the ventilation systems along the sides of the plane. It almost looks like there's some sort of very translucent fog. It's very bizarre. And it's starting to get extremely cold. Blah, blah, blah. Really cold. So people are, they're really freaking out because they're getting cold. Here they are. They're wearing shorts. And they're wearing Hawaiian shirts. Now, Sayla over here, she's wearing these jogging pants. And she's all layered up, remember? She's not cold. Not not the least. Mm -mm. And next thing you know, she's looking over to the gentleman sitting next to her, and he just, he passes out. She's like, what the hell? She turns, she turns around, and she notices the people behind her. They're all passed out, too. And she's monitoring. She's seeing the middle row and the next row, and all these people are just, they're passing out, buddy. They are. She's not passing out because she doesn't have that on her face. And then it's getting colder and colder and colder, buddy. Then suddenly, two people with white parkers and hoods that are wearing goggles... And they have two tubes that are coming out of their nose, wrapping up around their ears behind the hoodie of this Parker. They come out with clipboards, and they start walking down the aisles, looking at each passenger and placing their fingers where their juggler vein would be to get a heartbeat or not. Oh, man, you talk about terrifying. And she's watching this. She's like, she's squinting, and she can't even believe what's happening. 
And as they start going from person to person to person to person, and all these people are all passed out. Some people have the mask on, some of them don't. It doesn't even matter at this point. Because whatever was in the mask, it sure the hell wasn't oxygen. It had a metallic... Oh, Sailor knew it wasn't oxygen. So she's got to pretend like she's passed out. She's like this. And all of a sudden she can feel this person come over and they place their fingers on a juggler vein to get a heartbeat and they make a little notation on the clipboard. They keep moving down and down and down. All the passengers on the plane. Oh, it's terrifying, man. Something's, something's wrong with this picture. Something is wrong with this picture. And it's getting colder and colder. Oh my gosh, it, it is getting so cold. And Sayla looks out the window there just a little bit and she sees a little bitty island. And this island is teeny, tiny, tiny, tiny. And she's noticing that the plane is descending downward. The plane is going to land on this island. And this island is so puny. It, it doesn't even seem like the plane could land on the island. It's that small. At least from her point of view. So she's kind of looking at this eye here and looking at this eye there. And all of a sudden, sure enough, they land on this island. On this runway. And in the middle of nowhere. In the middle of the ocean. It sure the hell isn't Sydney, Australia. I'll tell you that right now. Mm -mm. No, it's not. So she's trying to be real still, and it is cold. Now it's becoming cold to her. It's got to be freezing, for sure. And this has been going on for a good 20 minutes or so. I was just horrible. Or what she thinks is 20 minutes. Maybe it's longer. Who knows? She's sitting there like this. She's kind of peeking with this eye. Looking for light leaks. You know how it is. The plane comes to a stop. And more of these people come out with these big, huge white parkers. And they got these goggles with these tubes coming out, going up and around inside the parker. Then they're rolling some sort of crate that's about at least five to six feet tall with a bunch of little co compartments in it. And you can move it around like, like this. It's really weird. Kind of like a some sort of apparatus that you'd have all the, the trays on for food. That's oh, crazy. It's kind of creepy. Got all these little compartments. The plane is at a standstill. And it's cold as hell in there. I mean, it's freezing. Then two more people come out from the back wearing the parkers and they got drills with them. And they go up to the first three seats that are in the middle and you hear them... <laughs> They're undoing the seats. So they take their three fingers, they put it through the juggler veins of the three passengers, four passengers in the center. And it's not like these people are in the state of some sort of like rigamorphous, no. But like I said, it's so cold. These people are no longer with us, if you get my meaning. Mm -mm. People in the center... So they take these, they take the people out of the seats, and then they take the seats totally. They set them off to the side. Two more guys come out from the back, and they got these things that look like stretchers. That's so bizarre. Wearing the big Parkers, the goggles. Got the tubes coming out their nose, and she is terrified because something is about to happen. They wheel these stretchers and such. And they're kind of low to the ground. And where they took the seats out in the center, they parked these stretchers like this, one on this side, one on this side. And they bring them up where they're about waist high. They take one of the passengers that they put off to the side next to the seat that they undid from the floor. They set one of the passengers up there and two, what appears to be men, are trying to stretch that passenger down because they're, for the most part, frozen. So cold. And they're no longer with us. 
Then this other guy grabs out of the component, which looks like some sort of trays for food, and he places this box over the head of the person that's laying on the gurney there, and this other guy comes out with this very strange-looking spoon, scissory-looking thing, and pops out his eye, puts that into a little bit of box, and marks it with a little sharpie. She's watching this, and she's getting terrified. I mean, she's starting to shake. Boy, I tell you what. She's like, oh. She is starting to flip out, because this is real, buddy. This is real. This isn't fantasy land. They take the other eye, they take this spoon-looking scissor apparatus, boop, pop out the other one. Then this other guy gets in there with a cordless, like, it looks like a skill saw. They're doing what is called a human crack, where they crack from the neck part all the way down. You got another person there, he's taking the heart and the lungs and the kidneys. All the vital organs. Oh boy, this is not good. Meanwhile, you got Salem. She just a, she's a terrified boy. She's terrified. And they're doing this stuff with such precision like they did it before. She looks out the window over on this side here and she sees these people with Munum Airlines logos on them. And they're holding these, oh, these apparatuses are so strange. They're so weird. It almost look like a, a baseball bat down here, but it's square, like mid-bat. And then there's some sort of, it looks like a antenna-looking thing with a big ball on the top of it. Oh, it's so bizarre-looking. I mean, it's strange. It doesn't even look like a metal protector. It looks like some sort of futuristic laser gun or something. It's weird. It's just weird. So as they get done, all, all you can hear is plop, plop, plop. <laughs> Stuff is flying all over it. Oh, it's just disgusting. It's so cold. It's so cold. Then they start taking the passengers off from the right and the left. And they start one by one. She's only seven, seven seats deep, buddy, on the far right-hand side. They're going to be to her in no time. She doesn't know what to do. She is shaking profusely. She is shaking so bad. She is so terrified. She can hear her heart beating. You know how when you're so scared you can hear your heart beating and you would swear that it's so loud that everybody else can hear it. You know what I'm saying? She is terrified. Her teeth are just a chatter and she can't even help herself. But she's got to pretend to be gone in that. What's going to happen when they come to her? Then, of course, the fella sitting right next to her, they snatch him up. Two guys are forcing his body down because it's so cold. There you go again with that spoon-looking scissor. Pop out. They get out the skill saw. They start cracking. <laughs> Stuff is flying all over. Oh, it's just horrible. She is terrified. They go to grab her. You got to remember, she was in these long pants, jogging pants. She was all layered up. She had the windbreaker on. That's what saved her for the time being. They go to grab her, and she flips out, man. She flips out. Ah, she starts screaming. Her They're fighting. They're trying to wrestle around to the floor, and they pulled out this weird-looking, same thing that these guys outside had. It's kind of round, and then it goes into a square, and then it looks like an antenna with a ball on the end. They hit it with, hit her with that, and she, she is out, buddy. Just that quick. Lights out. And on and on and on and on. That's what they're doing. They're taking all of these people out of the passenger seats taking their eyes and they're cracking them open. They're taking all their vital organs. And when they're done with them, they're putting them back in their seats. It's horrible. It's disgusting. Man. This goes on for hours and hours and hours and hours. <sighs> hours and hours later, Sela starts waking up. 
If you start seeing the room like going this way and going that way, start seeing all the little black dots. And as she's coming to, a little bit groggy, she sees a man standing above her. He's not wearing any, you know, garb. He's not wearing some parker with goggles and stuff. No, he's just a man standing there. And he's kind of like got a little rag on her head. She's coming to and she's like, What happened? He goes, Oh, you know what? You, you passed out. Uh, I did? He's hitting her head with a rag. He goes, yeah, yeah, you did. You know what? Why don't you have a little bit of broth? Come on. Have a little bit of broth. Takes a spoon. He puts it up to her. And she... It's kind of hard to swallow. right? He goes, here, have a little bit more. Okay, 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 go ahead. Um... He goes, well, what do you remember? Oh, it was horrible, you know, the, the, the plane, is just, uh, I was on this plane, and and um, uh, then the, the mast started falling down, and uh, I was trying to remember, uh, you know, what to do, and, you know, because, I mean, who really listens to all the safety nonsense, you know, at the beginning of the flight, who really cares, right? But when you're in the position, oh, you're trying to remember. And then the mast came down, it didn't smell like oxygen, and I, I discarded it, and then, you know, the person next to me, next thing you know, these people with Parkers, and I said, well, where am I? He goes, settle, settle down. What, what's your name? Well, I'm Sayla. Here, have some more broth. She's like, well, who are you? I'm Captain Williams. Captain Williams? Am, am I on some sort of military base or something? Well, yeah. You're on uh, Diego Garcia. She goes, Diego Garcia? Yes. She goes, okay, um, okay, wh where am I specifically? And Captain Williams takes that curtain and moves the curtain. He goes, well, you're on flight Seven, seven, seven. I monograph, and if you can't speak freely or simply, not free.